Mild cognitive impairment. What is it? And what should you do if you have it? If you haven't watched before, my name is Dr. Nicole Didick. I'm an internist and geriatrician, so I'm a doctor who looks after older adults. Here on The Wrinkle, I give you advice that you can use to age well, or to look after someone who's aging. Today we're going to talk about mild cognitive impairment. Being a medical term, we like to use short forms, so we're going to call it MCI. It's gone by different names in the past, but we'll use MCI today. I thought I would cover this topic because a friend of mine uh, showed me this article about how you can take a ketone drink and the article indicated that you could possibly take this if you have mild cognitive impairment to prevent progression or to reverse some of those changes. So I thought I better look into this and see if it's something I should recommend. I'll tell you a little bit later what my thoughts are. But let's talk about mild cognitive impairment. So what is mild cognitive impairment? Well, let's talk about the spectrum of changes with the aging brain. As we age, about 5% of people have no change at all in their brain performance. That's about the same percentage of people who don't get gray hair. So the typical situation is that there are some normal changes with aging. Most of these are in short-term memory or working memory. So people who are aging might notice that they need to bring a shopping list when they go to the grocery store, whereas before they used to just remember what they needed. Um, they might also notice that they can't keep as many things on the go at the same time, so multitasking might be harder. But people who have normal aging um, should still be able to manage their day-to-day -day lives with no difficulty, the same way that they always did. And if they were to go a neurocognitive test in a doctor or psychologist's office, um, then they would score within a normal range for them. At the other end of the spectrum is dementia. Now remember, dementia is kind of an umbrella term. So there are many different types of dementia or causes of dementia, and Alzheimer's is one of them. It's the most common cause of dementia in Canada. But there are other causes like vascular or stroke-related dementia, there's Parkinson's disease-related dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, frontotemporal dementia, and many other types. And sometimes people have a mixture of two or more of those types. In dementia, in order to make that diagnosis, we have to see that day-to-day -day life is affected by cognition. Cognition is all the different kinds of thinking that we do. So it includes things like memory and language skills, um, it includes how we interpret the world on a visual spatial basis. And it includes things like executive function. So that higher order abstract thinking, being able to plan and execute on that plan. It can also include things like concentration and being oriented to where you are and who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. So if something is going wrong in one or more of those domains, and it's severe enough to get in the way of day-to-day -day life so that a person is having trouble with things, even minor things like managing their medications or doing their finances, then that could be in keeping with a dementia. Now with dementia, we have to make sure that those changes aren't due to something else like a medication or another medical condition. But usually dementia, almost all types of it, are, is progressive. Um, so a person who's living with dementia, usually the longer they live with it, the more those symptoms get in the way. So where does mild cognitive impairment fit in? Well, it's on that spectrum between normal aging and dementia. But it's kind of an umbrella term as well. Let me explain. In order to make a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, we do have to see that someone has a change in one or more domains of cognition. A lot of times that's memory or amnestic mild cognitive impairment. That's the most common type of mild cognitive impairment, but it could be some other domain. And it has to be enough that either the person notices it or somebody else in their life um, or a doctor or nurse notices. The person has to have an intact day-to-day -day function. So they have to be able to manage their day-to-day -day life the same as they always did. We have to see that people are not having any difficulty with day-to-day -day function. 
If there's trouble with function, that pushes us more along the spectrum towards dementia usually. So the person has a perception that there's a change in cognition and their day-to-day -day life is still going well. But if they were to undergo some kind of objective measure, so that might be a cognitive test like the MOCA or some other type of neuropsychological battery, as it's sometimes called, a person with MCI would have a score on a neuropsychological test that is below what's expected. And when those tests are done, it should be done by a professional and it should take into account the person's age, education, and life experience. So in MCI, there's a perceived change in cognition. There is difficulty on some objective measure like a neurocognitive test, but day-to-day -day function is intact. That's MCI. Now, you can see there are some subtleties there. And if a doctor or other clinician is considering a diagnosis of MCI, there are a lot of things that have to be taken into account. First of all, it can be related to some other medical condition, like a depression or another psychiatric issue. All of those have to be well controlled before the MCI diagnosis can be made. It's a lot like when we make a dementia diagnosis. We want to make sure that the symptoms aren't due to something else. It's important as well to do some screening for certain metabolic conditions that can affect memory and thinking. Checking the thyroid, for example, checking a vitamin B12 level and maybe some other levels in the blood could be important. If you have mild cognitive impairment, do you need a scan like a CT or MRI? In mild cognitive impairment, there can be some changes um, that are more likely to occur in someone with mild cognitive impairment compared to someone who doesn't have it. But there's nothing that we would see on a scan that would really say, oh yeah, that looks like a mild cognitive impairment scan. Just like in dementia, we usually do scans to rule out other things that could be causing those symptoms. So if someone is considering an MCI diagnosis, they might want to do neuroimaging like a CT or MRI, just to make sure that there isn't something else like fluid on the brain, a stroke, a tumor, or another very uncommon cause of MCI-like symptoms. Now, how common is MCI? Well, just like in dementia, the risk of having MCI goes up with age. For those in the 80 to 84 age group, there's probably about a 25% prevalence of MCI. So 25% of people in that age group would probably meet the criteria for MCI. The risk factors for getting mild cognitive impairment include older age, but also having a lower education level, having more symptoms of depression or other neuropsychiatric symptoms at the time of diagnosis. The level of apolipoprotein E4 in the person's blood is a risk factor, but it's not something that we test for because it's really not that helpful in making the diagnosis. A history of stroke or having other vascular risk factors like diabetes, heart disease, or obesity are increased risk factors for having MCI as well. You might be thinking this sounds a lot like dementia, and there's definitely some overlap between these two conditions in terms of who they affect and what they look like. That's part of why it can take a skilled clinician to really determine whether the person has MCI or dementia or something else. If a person gets a diagnosis of MCI, does it mean that they have Alzheimer's or they're definitely going to get Alzheimer's soon? Having mild cognitive impairment is a risk factor for the development of dementia. And the most common type of dementia is Alzheimer's. For sure, there are some people who are living with that label of MCI who do have an early, uh, what we would call pre-clinical phase of Alzheimer's. But right now it's very hard to tell which of the people who have MCI are going to get Alzheimer's or are just gonna go on in that MCI category for the rest of their lives. Probably about 10% of people who have an MCI will develop dementia in the space of a year. So if you're living with MCI, chances are that a year from now, you'll still have MCI and you won't have progressed, but a significant number of people will progress. So a lot of people wanna know if they have mild cognitive impairment, what can they do about it to reduce the risk of it getting worse or progressing to dementia? Generally, MCI is something that we would follow over time. 
So if I have someone in my practice with MCI, I might see them again in a year just to check in on their cognitive status as well as how their day-to-day -day function is going. In order to determine if someone has converted from mild cognitive impairment to dementia, we want to see about how their day-to-day -day function is because those who have functional impairment because of their memory or thinking are more likely to fall into a dementia category, not just MCI. A lot of treatments have been studied for MCI, but so far there doesn't seem to be a medication or a particular exercise or cognitive activity that is the key to reversing or uh, preventing progression of MCI. We usually recommend all the things that we would do for brain health, so following a healthy diet, most likely a Mediterranean diet or the MIND diet, which is a combination of Mediterranean diet and DASH diet. We recommend stopping smoking, uh, limiting alcohol, maintaining a healthy body weight, and doing physical exercise. So, will a ketone drink a day keep the mild cognitive impairment away? Well, I was really interested when a friend of mine sent me an article about a ketone beverage that seems to improve thinking. Now, why would we give a ketone drink in the first place? Well, the human brain can use two types of fuel. It can use glucose or ketones. Glucose is almost always available, but in starvation mode, ketones are available, and that's what the brain would use. The brain actually prefers to use ketones when they are available compared to glucose. So it's much easier for it to be taken up into the brain. And it might even be easier in some disease states rather than glucose uptake. Because in some disease states like Alzheimer's, the glucose uptake could be impaired. So ketones might be a good way to get fuel to the brain. And that might improve brain performance. That's the theory in very simple terms. The use of ketones to modify cognitive function has been studied before. So people have looked at a ketogenic diet and that does seem to improve some components of brain function. In this study, they looked at taking a keto beverage twice a day. This study was done by some researchers uh, in Canada at the University of Sherbrooke in Quebec. They gave some healthy participants a ketone drink twice a day. So this was made up of a ketogenic medium chain fatty acid or triglyceride. And it was taken in drink form two times a day, 15 grams twice a day. The participants drank either this or a placebo for six months. And then they were tested again in terms of their neuropsychological function. They underwent what's called a neuropsychological battery. Uh, they took a bunch of memory tests, so things that included recall, language, um, abstraction, and many other domains of cognition. The researchers did find that there was improvement in free recall, so that would be a test of short-term memory, also in verbal fluency, which is a test of language, and in trail making, which looks at executive function. So that's pretty exciting that there was improvement in some of those cognitive tests. So does that mean that I'm gonna start recommending that beverage to my patients with MCI? Well, when I look at a scientific study, first of all, I wanna see if there's anything in the results that could bias them. I noticed in this study that one of the researchers does uh, receive grants from Nestle, which is the company that makes this ketogenic drink. Now, this was clearly disclosed in the publication. But, it, you know, that could introduce some potential bias, so that's why researchers are asked to disclose those kinds of relationships. Um, the study was in part sponsored by Nestle and also by the Alzheimer Association. Now, I also, when I read a study, want to know if the patients in the study are similar to those that I treat. The participants in this study were very healthy by my standards and by most people's standards. They were young, so the placebo group was average age 73 and the uh, ketogenic drink group was average age 71 or mean, mean age 71. So that's pretty young. And they did meet criteria for mild cognitive impairment, um, but they were pretty cognitively intact. So their scores on the MOCA um, had a mean score of 24, which is just below the cutoff of 26 out of 30. They were also fairly well educated with education between 12 and 13 years. In the study, they did exclude people with type two diabetes or depression. Um, so those are common conditions that I see in many of the older adults that I treat.
So the patients in this study would resemble a portion of my practice, but probably a smaller portion. Now, looking at the results, it is encouraging that there was improvement in some of those cognitive test scores. But that's what I would call a surrogate outcome. I also don't know if improvement on those test scores would translate into sustained improvement in function or maintenance of function in day-to-day -day life. I don't really care if somebody can remember three more words in five minutes if they still can't balance their checkbook. So cognitive testing is, is important to measure, but it's not always the most meaningful thing that we're looking for in a therapy. I think these results are exciting, but I don't know if I have enough information to recommend taking this product uh, to my patients. I need to learn more about it, and I'll be really interested to see if these studies are carried on for a longer period of time, maybe in people who have more cognitive symptoms, and uh, maybe following other outcomes um, that are relevant and important in people's lives. So if you think you have mild cognitive impairment, I hope this has given you some information about how to move forward and some of the things you might want to talk to a health professional or your family about. I'm so thankful that you watched today and I hope that you'll go visit my website. It's thewrinkle.ca. You can also join me on Facebook and Twitter and here on YouTube, I've got loads of videos that I think you'll enjoy. Quite a few of them have to do with healthy aging and the aging brain. I'd love if you leave a comment below. Let me know what else you'd like to see me do. And if you have any experience with MCI, I would love it if you could share. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time.